Hey guys, Kenny here. Today we're going to go ahead and build on what we talked about in terms of sustainable agriculture and sustainable food supply last class. And we're going to go ahead and discuss food labels and marketing. So when you go ahead and buy food, what does that label tell you? Uh, what about those little certifications uh, and that has on it certified organic or certified gluten free or what do all those things actually mean? So let's go ahead and look at our essential questions and we'll go from there. Number one, what should consumers know about their food? Good question. How can consumers tell whether a food label is trustworthy? Number three, how could food labeling be improved? Number four, how do food companies market their products? Five, how does food marketing affect our food choices? And six, how should food marketing be regulated, if at all? Now, you've all seen the food labels. Uh, you turn over basically anything you buy in the store and it's got a food label on it. But do you look at it? And if so, when you turn it over, what do you look for? Now, People look at food labels for different reasons, but whatever the reason, many consumers would like to know how to use this information more effectively and easily. The following label building skills are intended to make it easier for you to use nutrition labels to make quick informed food choices that contribute to a healthy diet and environmental impact. So this is a good example of what you would see on the back of some food. Um, so it says nutrition facts in most cases. And one of the big things I wanna point out right away is where it says serving size, okay? Now, serving size is a little deceptive okay? because you may realize that when you eat it, you eat way more than a single serving every time. And all of the nutrition facts that they give you below are based on that serving size. So when we go ahead and take a look at it, this is serving size right here, okay? This is our serving size. Now, some serving sizes are realistic. You would eat this many or this much of it, others not. And so this is where our first level of deception kind of comes into play. Uh, the next thing is calories. Not all calories are created equal. When we start taking a look at calories, most people think of calories as a bad thing and you're trying to count calories and avoid calories. But some calories are better for you than other calories. And so we have to learn to balance those. Uh, fats and cholesterol, if you look at that as a percentage of the overall uh, contents, percent of your daily value, you can see just how much you're getting from it. But again, you have to tie that back into your serving size. Sodium usually relates to how much salt is in something. Carbohydrates are gonna give you, you know, food that you can break down and consume, but we have to be careful and see how much of this is that, that is fiber, how much of that is sugars. We look at protein. Protein is usually something good, although not all proteins are made evenly either. And then we have our vitamins and minerals. Okay. So we kind of finish up by looking at your vitamins and minerals, but this is kind of hit and miss depending on what vitamins and what minerals you're looking at. And some packages don't really even show this at all. So we also have to kind of pair up what we've seen here in terms of our nutrition facts with the ingredients. And the ingredients may be on the same size, but other places they're on the opposite side of the box, depends on the box. And they're usually listed in descending order by weight. So again, pay attention to the by weight piece because that's gonna change based on the density of the material, how heavy it is. So two things that may have the same amount of it in there, the heavier one will be listed first. So, but that's pretty good in terms of you understanding what is the most uh, included ingredient in that particular item and what is the least as you go through it in order. Now, as you're looking through these and as you're examining those food labels for your particular food stuff, I want you to kind of keep in mind that there are a lot of these little food labeling tricks, if you will, to go ahead and get you to, oh, buy this one versus buying something else. So let's take a look at some of the more common food labeling tricks. So again, I already mentioned the first one, the serving size. Um, 
this idea of baked, not fried. Now, it can mean that it you know, uses less oil, so there's less fat, less cholesterol, all these types of things, but you really have to check the facts, the, the nutrition facts to make sure that's true. No sugar added to me is a huge labeling trick. That doesn't mean it's not sweet. They may put these artificial sugars in there and those artificial sugars may be worse for you than the sugars themselves. Fat free, okay, this means natural fats, but there are other fat substitutes or bulking agents, things like that you put in as well. The idea of natural packaging, well, that natural term is pretty loose. Light versus, or light, okay? The fact that it has less cal calories. The problem I have with this one is that usually when you look at light food or light beer or light whatever it is, mayonnaise, is that usually that means more synthetics, more fake things added to it. Um, so there are lots of different names that we can use for fats, sugars, these types of things. So you have to watch out and know what those different terms are. This idea of natural, all natural, organic, gluten-free. <sighs> Certain things are already inherently gluten-free. If something is made with oats rather than with wheat, it's gonna be gluten-free, it just is. Because um, gluten is something that comes along with wheat when you look at all natural, most of the materials we use in most cases are natural or all natural. And this term organic gets thrown around. Um, organic has a very specific scientific meaning and that's not what they mean here. You can be certified organic or you can say organic. Certified USDA organic has very specific requirements to meet. Um, but there are things that technically, scientifically are never going to be organic. They get labeled organic because they meet those USDA organic requirements. The concept of cage-free or free range, that's a pretty loose definition. We talked about this when we were looking at sustainability the other day. And all they have to be given is a door that they could potentially access to be considered free range. Um, and then multigrain. If you have more than one grain, you are multigrain. That doesn't always mean the same thing. So we got to kind of keep these food tricks in mind when we think about labeling. Now, I was talking about being certified organic, okay? Because we talked about organic agriculture as being something that's good and more sustainable. Well, what technically does that actually mean? To be certified USDA organic, you have to meet the following requirements. You can't use synthetic fertilizers. Most pesticides are prohibited. Notice that key word most. It doesn't say all, most. There can be no added hormones or antibiotics if it's an animal product. It cannot be genetically engineered organisms. So you can't use GMOs if you're gonna be certified organic. And if it's an animal, must be able to express a certain natural behavior. If it's a cow, it has to graze. If it's chicken, it has to be able to scratch and do these things. So this kind of rules out CAFOs. Okay, so CAFOs do not meet the USDA regulations or requirements for organic. All right, so what does it mean to be natural? It has no artificial flavors, no artificial flavors, no synthetic ingredients. But these FDA standards are not really enforced. So you can say natural um, <laughs> and loosey-goosey, right? Um, so the USA, USDA regulates the label on meat and poultry products much more so than it does so for other materials, especially related to uh, plants, okay? So you take a look at Cheetos. Have you ever thought of Cheetos as being natural? And probably not, but certified natural right here. Why? Because they say no artificial colors, no artificial flavors, and no synthetic ingredient. Okay. And so you can see right there printed on the label, no preservatives, no artificial flavors, no artificial colors. And they get the designation. Um, one thing that I always thought would be interesting, and I was looking around to see if anybody had brought it up before, and it actually has been done in the country of Denmark. And that's to label food based on its environmental impact. In Denmark, 
they are working to label foods according to their effect on climate change. Denmark has introduced a legislation, legislative proposal that would require food to be labeled according to its effect on climate change. Really interesting, right? Why should you care? Well, how food is grown, processed, and transported, not just those food miles, but those production costs in terms of the environmental impact, significantly impacts the environment. Informed consumers can hold industries accountable to reduce food loss and waste and call for more sustainable production. Denmark is showing leadership on this issue and join us in taking action here. And this is from a website where this was being pushed by an American uh, group. Okay. So what exactly does that look like? Well, when we think about Denmark food and climate change, what they've said is that they want to give consumers the means to assess the, in supermarkets the environmental impact of their products. And this is from the Minister of the Environment, Lars Christian Lilleholt. Now, the initiative is part of a new 38-point climate and air proposal titled Together for a Greener Future, which the government presented in 2018. So what would that environmental labeling look like? Well, this is an example that suggests what it might look like. So you can see how much water it uses, how much emissions water, uh, how much emissions it produces, what its impact is in terms of biodiversity. Is this a monoculture? Is this part of polyculture? That type of thing. And then you can see the pot pesticide toxicity and the colors represented there, as well as the size of the lobe, tells you how impactful it is on the environment. So the one on the left has a big water use and lots of pesticides. The one on the right has almost no water use and is fairly low when it comes to both pesticides and biodiversity impact. Okay, so if you knew these things and you could compare two products side by side, you'd probably be more likely to go ahead and buy the one on the right because it's a much cleaner, you know, impact on the environment. Now, we do have some labels like this currently, nothing with respect to our food choices, but you've probably seen these if your family has ever bought a new appliance. Okay. It's not perfect, but we're headed in the right direction. You know, current labeling is far from complete, but has already set the precedent for labeling based on environmental impact. This is that energy star rating that you see on washers, dryers, refrigerators, dishwashers, you name it, televisions. Okay. So we can do better. And we need to think about what steps we could make to pressure government bodies and entities to go ahead and label to at least give us the information to make those informed decisions. Now, I wanted to kind of take some time to kind of um, look at the impact of marketing on you. You know, many companies are so focused on developing their brand that you don't even necessarily need to see the name to know who it belongs to. And so I wanted to start by testing your brand recognition. How many of these companies and products can you identify just based on a tiny little piece of their logo? It's probably more than you think. Okay. Let's go ahead and give it a try. Let's start with letter A. What is it? Did you get it? If you guess Coca-Cola, you're right. What about B? Did you get that one? That's right, Taco Bell. What about C? Oh, you probably all got that one. That's right, that's McDonald's, it's the golden arch. Not even the whole thing. I bet you can get D too. That's right, D, no one out pizzas the hut. That's Pizza Hut. All right, let's try letter E. Hmm, maybe you got somebody got fooled on that one? Yeah, that's Burger King, okay. Oh, this one is interesting. I know my kids could probably get this one. What about F? Did you get Subway? Very good. All right, what about G? Starbucks, good, you guys are good. All right, what about H? H was a hard one for me. This actually comes from Dunkin' Donuts, okay? Um, I was really good at I. What about you guys? Did you get I? That's right. I is Gatorade. Gatorade. I had the darndest time with Jay. This next one, I had no idea what it was from. 
Can you get J? That's right. It's little Debbie. Okay. The little snack cakes. Okay. All right. Two more. What about K? Can you figure out K? That's right. It's Sprite. Very good. And then I, it's a really popular one right now. It's commercials on TV all the time. That's right. L, not I. L is KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. All right. So why do you know all these things, even from tiny little snippets of it? Well, that's because of how much money we spend advertising. Annual spending by U.S. food and beverage manufacturers on advertising in 1997, which was the last year industry-wide data were openly available. Uh, laws have now gone to place to protect the companies so that we don't know exactly how much money they're spending on advertisement. And if you take a look at that, this is in millions of dollars. If you look on the far left there, 1,500 millions prepared convenience foods, they spent one over $1.5 billion on advertising to you. Prepared convenience foods. All right, look at the next one, soft drinks. That's over $1.25 billion. Candy, snacks, over $1 billion. Same thing with bakery goods and cookies and alcoholic beverages. Miller time, right? The high life, all these things. Think about Super Bowl commercials. How many of these do you see in there, right? That's a huge one. There's tons of spending in the Super Bowl. Then you go ahead and get to the things that we actually are supposed to be eating, the ones that are part of a regular diet. Meat and dairy products, they have almost, let's see, just shy of 750 million. And then you see the advertising for fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans, and that's actually uh, less than $250 million in ads. Okay. So let's see if you can go ahead and guess some of these just based on what we've talked about. Does anybody know what the most profitable soda brand in the world is? That's right. It's Coca-Cola. Uh, Pepsi is a close second, but yeah, Coke still, still is king. Can you name two pro food products that feature cartoon characters in their ads or on their packaging? Two of them. Well, there's actually lots that you can go ahead and pick from here. Uh, Frosted Flakes, they're great. Uh, Captain Crunch, Rice Krispie. I mean, the list is huge here. So uh, there are just a couple, but you can pick many, many more. Can you name two cartoon mascots that appear in ads for vegetables, fruits, or nuts? Well, one of them that I, I used to always think of, they just killed off the other a year ago or so. And that was Mr. Peanut, um, but they have the Jolly Green Giant. I always love Vlasic pickles, so that's why I put Vlasic Stork here, but I always think of the Vlasic Stork. And again, there are a whole bunch here, but the point of having a cartoon character or a cartoon mascot is to appeal to kids, to try and get them hooked, right? Isn't that kind of the drug dealer mentality? That's, that's a little scary. So what is the influence of ads? Well, in a 2006 study, people were shown different brands while their brains were hooked up to an MRI. Seeing the most well-known brands activated parts of the brain associated with which of the following? Reward, positive emotions, self-identity, or all of the above? Well, if you answered all of the above, you're correct. All right, another question. In 2010, the Television Bureau of Canada launched an advertising campaign featuring broccoli as the miracle food. Following the campaign, broccoli sales did what? Increased, decreased, or stayed the same? Yeah, following an ad campaign, even for broccoli, sales go up, okay? We are very, very susceptible to advertising. All right, so let's look at a little bit further at the impact on children. At what age do children become able to understand that the purpose of commercials is to persuade them to buy products? Is it age four, age six, age eight, age 10? I bet most of you went either high or low on this one, but the actual age, according to studies, is the age of eight, 
this is always kind of gets to me because my kids are eight and 10. So they're right in that window where advertising is really kind of hitting them. And for my younger son, we definitely had to kind of go over with him that, you know, ads aren't always quite as true as maybe you think they are because he was taking them a lot at face value. All right. So what kind of tactics are they using? Well, successful marketing often involves developing unique products. For every successful new product, there are plenty of failures. Which of the following real products was not a marketing failure? Hey, now some of you may be thinking that some of these are not even real, but these were all real products, real products. And the one that was the most successful, I mean, I actually eat it myself, was Greek yogurt. Okay, they tried to push out a new yogurt that was more based on you know, Greek tradition, so it was heavier, had more protein in it, but there was a Lifesaver soda. There was a Pepsi AM, the breakfast cola. And Colgate, yes, the toothpaste manufacturer, had their own brand of frozen entree dishes. Okay, um, they did not make it. So placing candy and other tempting products at the cash register is designed to encourage spur of the moment purchases. What do we call this tactic? Is it called impulse marketing, drip marketing, niche marketing, or ambush marketing? Were you able to come up with impulse marketing? Yeah, it's an impulse buy. You see it, you're like, ooh, that sounds great. And you give it at the last sentence. Second, you didn't plan on it, but you got it because it was there. Now, what is the main reason companies sell sodas and other products in schools? Can you think about that? I mean, this is one of the reasons that you don't really see as many of the vending machines at Willamette is that there was kind of a backlash against the exact reason why they do this. Yeah, the whole purpose, and this is why a lot of these companies actually invest, especially in the sports programs at schools, is so that they can get that big banner up at the football game or at the baseball stadium. Um, they're trying to build brand loyalty. They want you to buy what they're selling. So I hope this helps you think about how we do labeling and marketing and that impact on your food choices. So that's what I've got for you today. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.